when a person rushes to catch an elevator, the person there is in no danger of being crushed by the closing doors. Instead, the doors magically reverse themselves and open as soon as a part of the person's body comes between them. Most people know the elevator doors have an electric eye that senses anything that comes between them. But few people realize that the physical principle behind this simple device is one of the foundations of modern physics and led to a Nobel Prize for Albert Einstein. During the latter part of the 19th century, experimenters noted a glowing beam emitting from the negative electrode of a gas discharge tube. The negative electrode is known as the cathode, so they dubbed the emissions cathode rays. J.J. Thompson noted that electric or magnetic fields deflected the cathode rays, so he believed they were tiny, negatively charged particles. To find out more about the rays, he constructed a cathode ray tube with plates to produce an electric field that deflected the cathode rays in one direction and coils to produce a magnetic field that deflected them in another direction. By varying the strength of the electric field in the tube, Thompson was able to adjust the beam to the point that its path was undeflected. Because he knew the force exerted on the cathode ray particles by the electric field, as well as the force exerted on the particles by the magnetic field, and because he knew those forces were equal when the beam in the tube remained undeflected, he was able to determine the charge-to-mass ratio of a cathode ray particle. This particle is now known as the electron, and Thompson is credited with its discovery. Later, Robert Millikan determined the mass of an electron with his oil drop experiment. Millikan sprayed tiny drops of electrically charged mineral oil in an electric field. He then adjusted the electric field such that the force from gravity on a drop was just balanced by the force exerted on it by the electric field. From this information, he was able to determine the charge on the oil drop, which he discovered was always an integral multiple of some smallest charge. He concluded this smallest charge was that of an electron and using the previously determined mass to charge ratio of the electron. He determined the mass of the electron. We learned in an earlier section that all objects emit thermal radiation with an intensity proportional to the fourth power of their temperature. At normal temperature, this radiation is not visible. But an object of about 1000 kelvins has a visible reddish glow. When its temperature exceeds about 2,000 kelvins, the object has a whitish glow. A plot of intensity versus wavelength of radiation from an idealized black body at different temperatures shows each temperature actually corresponds to a continuous range of wavelengths. The classical theory developed at the end of the 19th century indicated that thermal radiation results from oscillating electric charges in the molecules of a substance. The theory implied that the intensity of the black body radiation should be inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength. However, experimental data for short wavelengths failed to show this relationship. In 1900, Max Planck explained black body radiation with his theory that thermal oscillators have only discrete quantities of energy, rather than the continuous distribution indicated by classical theory. These discrete amounts of energy are related to the oscillation frequency and a constant now known as Planck's constant. This theory is known as Planck's quantum hypothesis, and the smallest possible oscillator energy is called a quantum of energy. Few, including Planck, were confident in the validity of the quantum hypothesis until 1905, when Einstein proposed a new theory of light. Einstein theorized that if the energy of molecular oscillators is quantized, then the emitted radiation must also be quantized. He conjectured further that light is transmitted as discrete particles, or quanta, rather than as waves 
which can only be absorbed or emitted in whole units. Each light particle, known as a photon, has an energy corresponding to its frequency and Planck's constant. Let's estimate the number of photons emitted per second by a 60 watt light bulb. Assume that 10% of the electrical energy used by the bulb is converted to light. What is the light energy emitted per second by the light bulb? Correct, it uses 6 joules of energy in one second. Next, assume that the average wavelength of light emitted by the light bulb is 550 nanometers. How many photons are emitted per second by the light bulb? Correct, the light bulb emits a very large number of photons each second. When light strikes the surface of certain metallic materials, electrons are emitted. This is known as the photoelectric effect. Originally, photocells were constructed by using a photosensitive metal as a cathode in an evacuated tube. By applying a voltage to the anode and cathode of the cell, the photoelectrons emitted by the cathode move to the anode and a current flows in the circuit. Today, most photocells in use are solid-state photocells. They have largely replaced the classic vacuum tube photocells. A solar panel used for converting light energy into electricity is constructed of an array of photocells. When the light to the photocells is blocked, no current flows. When the light shines on the photocells, current flows. Increasing the intensity of the light shining on the photocells increases the intensity of the current. Classical theory could account for this, but the theory could not explain other photoelectric effect characteristics. Einstein used the quantum theory of light to explain the photoelectric effect in 1905 and later won a Nobel Prize for his efforts. A photon of light has a discrete amount of energy that it can provide to an electron in a photosensitive metal. The electron is bound by attractive forces in the material and, as a result, some of the photon's energy does work to free the electron. The remaining energy goes into the kinetic energy of the displaced photoelectron. Thus, the maximum kinetic energy a photoelectron can have is related to the energy of the incident photon and the minimum work required to free the electron. The latter is also known as the work function. The maximum kinetic energy of photoelectrons varies linearly with the light frequency. No photoemission occurs in a material if the frequency of the incident light falls below a certain cutoff or threshold frequency. This threshold frequency is related to the work function and Planck's constant. Let's determine the maximum speed of a photoelectron emitted by a metal with a known threshold frequency when the metal is illuminated by light having a wavelength of 600 nanometers. What is the photon energy? Try again. Try again. Correct. The photon energy is determined from quantum theory. What is the work function? Correct. The work function is determined from the threshold frequency. Now, what is the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectron? Try again. Try again. Correct. The maximum kinetic energy of the electron is determined from the photon energy and the work function. Finally, what is the maximum speed of the photoelectron? When the light shining on the elevator photocell is blocked, a sudden drop of current in the circuit occurs. This activates a relay switch that reverses the motion of the elevator doors. Photocells are used for many diverse applications. Automatic light switches that detect low light levels. 
photographic light meters that measure light intensity, smoke detectors that sense small numbers of smoke particles, and compact disc players that read the encoded music information on the disc. Let's look more closely at the workings of a photocell. In 1923, experiments of Arthur Compton provided further evidence supporting the quantum theory of light. Compton observed the scattering of short wavelength photons, what we call X-rays, by various materials. He discovered that scattered radiation always has a slightly longer wavelength than incident radiation. Furthermore, he saw that the change in the wavelength depends on the scattering angle, but not on the scattering material. His observations became known as the Compton effect. They could not be explained by the classical wave theory of light. Compton assumed that the photons acted as particles colliding elastically with electrons in the target materials. The relationship between a photon's momentum and energy is given by relativistic theory. When this is combined with the expression for the energy of a photon from quantum theory, the momentum of the photon can be related to its wavelength. Using this information, Compton derived an equation for the change in wavelength of the scattered photon. The change in wavelength depends on the scattering angle of the photon, and a constant known as the Compton wavelength. Now suppose an X-ray is scattered by a gold block at an angle of 30 degrees, and the scattered wavelength is 0.14 nanometers. A second X-ray is scattered by a plastic block at an angle of 30 degrees, and the scattered wavelength is 0.14 nanometers. How does the incident wavelength of the first X-ray compare to that of the second X-ray? Correct. The incident wavelengths are the same because they depend only on the scattering angle and the scattered wavelength, which are the same in each case.